So what, what do we mean by comprehensive Anglicanism? Every now and again, the Archbishop of Sydney will say something publicly which uh, startles or confuses or concerns people in this diocese or in Anglicare or in our schools, and they ring me up or they send me emails um, and they ask me, is that us? Is that, is that what all Anglicans think? Is that what all Anglicans believe? And often I say, well, not all Anglicans believe and think that way. You see, there are different sorts of Anglicans. There are different styles. There are different emphases. There are different ways of um, worshipping. There are different liturgical preferences. There are different approaches to authority. There are different understandings of the sacraments. There are different ways of doing theology. There are different ways of praying and relating to God. And there are different preferred ways of proclaiming the gospel and contributing to the kingdom of God. So having said that, um, of course, there's also a great deal all Anglicans have in common. We value common prayer. We use authorised forms of worship and prayer books. Well, mostly we do. Um, we all hold to the authority of the scriptures. But much of this is common to mainstream Christianity. So what characterises Anglican identity? Well, William Temple was Archbishop of Canterbury in 1942, um, became Archbishop in 1942, and he, he was only Archbishop for a couple of years. He didn't, he didn't uh, live to see the end of World War II. I think he died sometime in 1944. But, but he made a real mark in what he said and what he wrote, and he's regarded as a quintessential Anglican. And when he was explaining Anglicanism, he said, he said this, and this puts it all in a nutshell, really. He says, our special character, our peculiar contribution to the universal church, arises from the fact that we have combined in our one fellowship, the traditional faith and order of the Catholic Church with that immediacy of approach to God through Christ to which the evangelical churches bear witness and freedom of intellectual inquiry whereby the correlation of Christian revelation and advancing knowledge is constantly affected. Okay, so Anglicans are a bit complex. Um, we've, got, we've got these three main streams woven together in our Anglican identity. The Catholic, the Protestant, Sometimes that's called reformed or evangelical. And intellectual inquiry. Sometimes that's called the liberal emphasis in Anglicanism. So let me, let me have a look at each of these three streams. First of all, Catholic faith and order. Now, for you legal eagles, and just to give you some boring ammunition if you want to bore your friends. This is the opening clause, section one of the Constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia. The opening words. The Anglican Church of Australia, being a part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Christ, 
holds the Christian faith as professed by the Church of Christ from primitive times and in particular as set forth in the creeds known as the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. Get the, can you hear the emphasis on primitive times, on the tradition, on what goes back to the very beginning? We preserve that. Catholic faith and order. Continuity with the original church, the apostolic church. So what does that involve? What are we preserving? Well, Anglicans have often looked at what's called the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral. It's called the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral because it began with a meeting of the American House of Bishops in 1887. They, they put it together, basically, and then they were so impressed with their own work that they took it to the... <laughs> They took it to the Lambeth Conference a year or two later, 1888, I think, and it was adapted slightly, changed slightly, but endorsed by all the bishops in the Anglican world. So it's called the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, and quadrilateral because there are four bits to it. Yeah. Okay. So, and originally, originally what the American House of Bishops was doing was a, that, that they were asking an ecumenical question. They were saying, if this church, this Anglican church, this Episcopal church, is going to unite with or combine with or enter into a full relationship with another church, what are the things that are essential in that other church for us to have full communion with them, to recognise their clergy and so on, for there to be no barriers between us? And they said, well, it's these four things, really. This is, the, this, is the, this is it in a nutshell. This is the crux of it. So, um, so this is not a full confessional statement of everything we believe. Anglicans don't have such a thing. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not everything, but it really is the heart of what has to be preserved if we're going to be true to the primitive apostolic church if we're going to be in continuity with that. So the four things are the Holy Scriptures as containing all things necessary for salvation. And we say um, yeah, a thing cannot be regarded as essential to salvation if you can't demonstrate it, prove it from the Scriptures. Um, there's lots of stuff we believe that isn't proven in the scriptures, but it's stuff that's not necessary for salvation. Okay? The creeds, so the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creeds as containing a sufficient statement of the Christian faith. So that's why I say to clergy, no, you can't write your own creeds. You can't write your own statement of belief, because that disconnects us from this ancient tradition, which is part and parcel of who we are. So you might, as an educational exercise, invite people to write their own creeds, but in worship on Sundays, what we do it clearly connects us with this stream going right back to the primitive church. The third element is the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. And, you know, Catholic Church and some more Catholic Anglicans talk about seven sacraments. Well, our prayer book distinguishes between the two sacraments that Christ himself instituted and gave signs for. They are called dominical sacraments, the sacraments of our Lord. And the others, well, you can argue about whether they're true sacraments or not, but you know, the, the, our prayer book and the articles distinguish between sacraments of the gospel the sacraments that Christ himself established in the gospel and other things that are called sacraments because they do have an outward sign of a spiritual grace. Marriage, uh, confirmation, um, anointing, ordination, etc. Okay, so the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion and the historic episcopate 
locally adapted. So that's bishops who ordain and send out clergy to proclaim the gospel and administer the sacraments. So this is the threefold order of ministry. Okay? So that's the heart, that's the heart of continuity with the primitive church. Um, now I had a I had an argumentative friend uh, when I was at university, uh, a Roman Catholic, and sometimes when he was in the mood for an argument, he'd say, I belong to the church Jesus started. Which one do you belong to? <laughs> There's this common kind of understanding that Henry VIII started the Anglican church in the 16th century because the Pope wouldn't approve his marriage to Anne Boleyn. Well... A little bit of history puts the lie to that kind of argument. Um, Pope Gregory the Great sent Augustine to Canterbury in 597. That's a thousand years before Henry. And what did Augustine find when he arrived in Kent and started travelling north and west? He, he ran into the ancient Celtic church which existed in the, in the north and the west of Britain, uh, pushed, pushed uh, into the outer limits by the invading um, Anglo-Saxons. But it was there, and it had maintained its life for nearly 200 years since Rome left Britain in about 410, I think it was. And we know that Patrick, St Patrick was wandering around the British Isles in the, in the 5th, century. Um, and we know that St Alban was the first British martyr and he was martyred in about 208. So, so the church had been in Britain since you know, almost apostolic time. So it goes back a long, long way and a long way before the turmoil of the 16th and 17th centuries when the Reformation movements hit. Um, but there is no doubting that those Reformation movements that swept through continental Europe also transformed the Church of England. Um, you know the story, I think, that in, in late medieval times, there was a kind of lifelong penitential cycle that had people firmly in its grip. Uh, people were thought to be born in original sin and destined for hell because of that. So babies had to be baptised as soon after they were born as possible because with the high infant mortality rates, if they died before they were baptised, they would burn in hell forever. Uh, everyone had to kind of achieve a state of grace in order to escape eternal damnation. So you had to be baptised as soon as possible after you were born. You had to go to confession regularly to receive absolution from a priest. You had to do penance regularly all through your life. And after death, you didn't go straight to heaven anyway. You went to purgatory where you had to work off you know, any leftover sins that hadn't been confessed and forgiven and so on. So this... this Trying to achieve a state of grace to be acceptable to God was what people spent their lives doing. And the whole system was centred around priests who dispensed grace through the sacraments which they tightly controlled. Now you can see how that sort of system is open to abuse. Eventually, someone had the bright idea of selling forgiveness. So people bought indulgences every time the Pope wanted to build a new basilica. Um, and Martin Luther just could not achieve peace in his own heart and mind that he would be eternally with God, that he would be saved. And so this, this anxiety ate away at him and he, he went back and read... Uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans again, really carefully, and it suddenly hit him that we are not saved by anything we do. We are saved by a gracious gift of God, and all we have to do is accept that, receive that, 
by faith. Um, and of course, this, this swept through uh, the continent and had its impact in England as well. Um, this reformed stream gave rise to the 39 Articles of Religion, which became officially authoritative for Anglicans. Um, and from this perspective, the primary source of authority is the Scriptures. The 39 Articles say that doctrine, faith, has to be tested against the Scriptures. The historic creeds can be believed because they can be proved by the scriptures. The general councils of the church were not infallible. Anything general councils said had to be tested against the scriptures. General councils can be in error. Um, in ordinations in medieval times, the ordaining bishop would hand over the chalice and the pattern, symbols of the sacraments, to the person being ordained. Well, uh, uh, during the Reformation, that practice was stopped and now the scriptures were handed over to the person being ordained. The authority is the scriptures. Um, in, in some Anglican churches and in Brisbane, you see both the chalice and the pattern and the scriptures being handed over to those who are newly ordained. The... Uh, 1662 Book of Common Prayer emerged through this Reformation process. And you know, probably, those of you who've used the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, and some of you may not have, um, it's packed full of quotes from Scripture, of scriptural um, paraphrases, of scriptural allusions. Just about everything in the Book of Common Prayer points to something in Scripture if it's not a direct quote. So this is the second emphasis in Anglicanism. Continuity with the ancient Catholic Church, then the major themes of the Reformation. The Church of England says it is Catholic and Reformed. So we didn't go along with everything that Luther and Calvin said, but the main themes of the Reformation, particularly justification by grace through faith, is embedded in Anglican souls. So, the third, the third emphasis is intellectual inquiry. And this means we draw on reason and experience as we do our thinking about life and faith. Um, William Temple called this freedom of intellectual inquiry to correlate Christian revelation, what's in the scriptures, and advancing knowledge. Human reason and experience and using our brains also have a proper place in the life of faith, say Anglicans. And behind this in influence, this emphasis, are the kind of currents of the Renaissance, the flowering of thought and discovery of all sorts that followed the Reformation movements in Europe, the emergence of critical reasoning, the uh, historical awareness and consciousness, and scientific methods, they all had their influence in the life of the church as well. Um, so this openness to reason and to intellectual inquiry is based on a, a theological conviction, a conviction about God. The conviction is that all truth ultimately comes from God. So no matter how we discover or discern truth, whether that's by reading the scriptures or by scientific research, all truth is telling us something about God. And we need to be open to truth as it's, as it's discovered, wherever it's discovered, because that's about discerning God's presence and activity in the world. So Anglicans tend to hear the voice of God in reason and try to remain open to truth however it's discovered, through philosophy, 
science, the arts, literature, music, poetry, they can all grasp something of God's truth. And this openness to reason and experience tends to give a kind of common sense flavour to Anglicanism. So that's the third element. The trouble is, these three sources are sometimes, and even often, in tension with each other. They don't always agree with each other. And so at the heart of Anglicanism is a constant tension, a constant dynamic kind of movement between the Catholic, the Evangelical and reason, where each informs and corrects the others. So right at the heart of who we are as Anglicans is a process of dialogue that requires a great deal of effort and energy to sustain. It's not all that easy to be an Anglican. You have to work at it a bit. And that's what Anglican comprehensiveness is all about. Let me um, share with you this quite long quote from the 1968 Lambeth Conference. The Anglican bishops were going on about this comprehensiveness and how important it is to them. And the Orthodox bishops, the bishops from the Eastern Orthodox churches who were there, couldn't really cotton on to what the Anglicans were on about. So they said, if comprehensiveness is not anything goes, what is it? You know, explain it to us. And this is what the Anglican bishops said, and this is written up in the 1968 Lambeth Conference report. Comprehensiveness is an attitude of mind which Anglicans have learned from the thought-provoking controversies of their history. Comprehensiveness demands agreement on fundamentals, the kinds of things that are in the Lambeth Quadrilateral, while tolerating disagreement on matters in which Christians may differ without breaking communion. In the mind of an Anglican, comprehensiveness is not compromise, nor is it to bargain one truth for another. Rather, it implies that the apprehension of truth is a growing thing. We only gradually succeed in knowing the truth. It's been the tradition of Anglicanism to contain within one body both Protestant, Evangelical and Catholic elements. But there's a continuing search for the whole truth in which these elements will find complete reconciliation. Comprehensiveness implies a willingness to allow liberty of interpretation and a certain slowness in arresting or restraining exploratory thinking. So there can be new ideas about which not everyone agrees within the Anglican Church. We allow space for exploration as long as the fundamentals are there. We tend to applaud the wisdom of the Rabbi Gamaliel's dictum in the Acts of the Apostles that if a thing is not of God, it won't last very long. It will die out. And moreover, we are alarmed by the sad experience of too hasty condemnation in the past as in the case of Galileo. Remember the Galileo story? Galileo got into trouble with the church because he said his scientific observations led him to conclude that the earth revolved around the sun, not the sun around the earth. Well, the church at that time said, that cannot be true because 
The scriptures say the sun revolves around the earth. You just read the Psalms. It says the sun rises in the east and goes down in the west. The sun that's moving. You can. Uh, the Psalms also say the the Lord has made the earth so firm that it shall never be moved. So the Psalms say, see how that approach to the scriptures at that time was in conflict with early scientific discoveries. And what that led to was on the basis of the truth discovered by science, Christians had to change the way they were reading the scriptures. See how that source, that source of intellectual inquiry, challenges and corrects the source of inquiry, which is the scriptures. Um, so this is the dynamic that's at the heart of Anglicanism. So there is, there is a place for new things. I, I, sorry, I didn't, I didn't finish off the last piece of that quote. We believe that leading us into the truth, the Holy Spirit may have some surprises in store for us in the future as he has had in the past. So get that openness. You know, we, ha we treasure, absolutely treasure our heritage, Catholic faith and order, and the scriptures have to be treated with the utmost seriousness, but so does what we're discovering through reason and experience. And it, in different ways, each of those three elements will correct and challenge the others. And we have, over time, you know, changed the way we've read the scriptures. Um, the ordination of women is an example of that. Um, Galileo, you can think of other examples. Remarriage of divorced people in church. There have been big issues which have really, the church has really wrestled with, and those issues threaten to tear the church apart at different times. Uh, but over time, Anglicans think we gradually discern the truth if we keep working with those tensions and hold the three together. Okay. So this is called the Anglican via media, the middle way. Um, but we don't, we don't um, bounce around with every newfangled idea that comes along. We don't immediately embrace something just because it's new. We test it. So here's another... Um, quote from William Temple. He says about this business about inheritance and new. He says, there's always an initial presumption in favour of the tradition because it represents the deposit of innumerable individual apprehensions through history. Nonetheless, it must be remembered that it is by fresh individual apprehensions that the tradition itself has been developed. And to reject a new intimation, a new idea, may be not the suppression of human aberration, but a quenching of the divine spirit. In each age, the Holy Spirit shows us new things because God hasn't finished with us yet. This dialogue, this dynamism, this constant movement and change and challenge and correction between the three streams that makes up Anglicanism, um, this process of dialogue and dialectic. One theologian talks about it like this. It fails if it becomes a search for some innocuous common denominator and for compromise in principles in the interests of institutional unity. It can sometimes be taken hostage by extremists 
in any one of the four camps. Now, he's talking about four camps. He's, talk he's separating reason and experience. He makes that two, two separate camps, like in the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So three camps, four camps. Extremists who become absolute about their own perspectives and motivated either to convert all others or to exclude them from the communion. We, we see that happening, don't we, around in, in the church at the moment. The Archbishop of Sydney, um, a couple of years ago, in his address to his synod, uh, was talking about the argument in society and in the church about same-sex marriage, same-sex blessings, and so, won't be any surprise to you that some bishops in the church and some Anglicans are in favour of it, voted for it in the referendum and so on. Um, but the Archbishop of Sydney said, if you want to change this church's doctrine of marriage, go and start a new church. Do not ruin the Anglican church. Please leave us. Now that's a, that's a, a kind of denial of this comprehensiveness where we can actually have within the church people who disagree without breaking communion. So that's what this theologian's talking about, John Wolfe. The dialectical process implied here is no mere juxtaposition of different views. The talk about the via media, the middle way, being in the middle, is really only a description of the dialogue as though it had come to rest, as though it stopped, as though it's all resolved, come to rest in some invisible equatorial point. But the reality behind the dialectical process demands continued discussion, never a premature resolution of the tension, as is imagined in most concepts of the middle way. From the very nature of the dialogue, there must be vigour, imagination, persistence, determination, respect for differences, and a spirit of reconciliation. No one of the four groups should be missing from the dialogue, nor should any be excluded by the others. What's required is not an exhausted and hostile state of non-communication. You disagree with me, so I won't, I won't even bother talking to you. You do, you do it your way and I'll do it God's way but the enduring of the tension in confidence that the truth will emerge from the dialogue. Being Anglican is quite hard work. It means living, it means living with people with whom you disagree and being sufficiently humble to acknowledge that they might teach you something. And in fact, it's a bit more than that. It's difficult to stay engaged with people with whom you differ. It requires maturity and respect and openness to the truth of their insights and preparedness to disagree and still stay in relationships. That's a key thing in what I mean by comprehensive Anglicanism. Those who differ in emphasis, preference and conviction still see those with whom they differ as gifts from God for their own sanctification. The 
person that you find most objectionable and want to avoid most of all may very well be the person God has sent you to make you more holy, to practice the gifts of patience (laughs) and forgiveness and tolerance and generosity. The danger that Anglicans live with constantly is the tendency of one part to be so sure that it owns all the truth for it to fly off and leave seeing the other parts as containing no truth at all. That kind of attitude threatens to fragment and disintegrate the whole dynamic system. It's only when each part is there and in tension with the others that the whole thing hangs together. So Anglicans, this comprehensive approach means living with tension, living with shades of grey, living with ambiguity and paradox, not having all the answers, not everything being black and white. But then we're kind of used to that, aren't we? That that is the Christian faith. We live with paradox all the time. The, The Trinity is a good example. God is one and God is three. Have you ever noticed how many guest preachers appear in parish churches on Trinity Sunday? (laughs) It's because the, the clergy don't want to try to explain that. God is one and God is three. It's a paradox. Jesus Christ is truly human and truly divine. Was the resurrection bodily or spiritually? Or spiritual? There's evidence in the New Testament for both views. In Luke 24, the risen Jesus appears in the upper room and he eats with them. And he says, look, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And St Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, the body is sown a physical body and raised a spiritual body. There's evidence or both. Comprehensive Anglicanism tries to live with paradox and ambiguity, not by resolving things in lowest common denominators, but by affirming there is truth in different positions which are in tension with one another. And we can live with that in the belief that in time, God's spirit will lead us more fully into the larger truth in which these apparent paradoxes will be resolved. You know the story about the four men who were led to an elephant? One got hold of its tail and said, oh, it's definitely a rope, can't be anything other than a rope. One was led to the elephant's side and put his hands on it and said, it's a barn, it's got to be a barn. You know, one was led to the elephant's leg, it's a tree. One was led to the elephant's tail, it's a spear. See, they had that partial grasp of the truth. But these apparently contradiction, contradictory perceptions are resolved when you see the bigger picture. We think that's going on with God as well. I actually think this kind of comprehensive Anglicanism has a lot going for it. And not just for Anglicans. It's inclusive. It's open to new truth. It's very respectful of our heritage and tradition. It pursues truth. It's committed to the truth. It rejects absolutism. It values different ways of knowing, the artistic, as well as the scientific, the intuitive, as well as the analytical. Now, I I think this actually has a lot to offer our wider community and our world, especially today when things are so polarised. Have you noticed how difficult it is today to have a reasonable conversation about any divisive issue? 
Things are resolved by who can shout the loudest or who can glue themselves to the road and disrupt the traffic the most. Even in our universities, people are being deplatformed. You know, we disagree with you, so you should not be allowed to speak. Now, this takes a very different, very different approach, which is about respecting people and listening carefully and trying to discern the truth uh, in the tensions. Enough from me. I'm glad I got to give you this lengthy lecture before lunch. It would have been deadly this afternoon, but <laughs> thank, thank you for staying awake and, uh, and listening.